Today is a celebration. It's a celebration of a very important milestone achieved in the process of breaking uh, the Lorentz cipher here during the war. 70 years to the day that the Colossus here found the wheel start positions for a Lorentz enciphered message destined for the German high command. All the people behind that effort, the innovators, the inventors, mathematicians, engineers, technicians, the operators, the linguists, the clerks, and everybody here did their work diligently to produce the best intelligence that any military commander could wish for. And in the process, they made history. And there are people here in front of you who were here who made history. I encourage you to take the chance to talk to them today and learn more of their story. So on behalf of all the trustees, all the staff and the volunteers at TNMOC, welcome to this very historic and significant listed building uh, where we've worked very hard to bring to life as a hands-on experience today uh, the history of breaking the Lorentz cipher and demonstrate just how challenging a task it was and how people had to work extraordinarily well together to get the results that made such a difference. Uh, within the group here today are my colleagues, my fellow trustees, staff, volunteers and members, but in particular our honoured guest veterans who worked here on Colossus, Tunney and elsewhere in Bletchley Park and other sites. So I'd like to extend a particular welcome, and please forgive me if I, if I miss any names, I apologize in advance. The Flowers family, uh, who I think are down to this side, uh, Tommy's son Ken, his wife Sue, and grandson Johnny. More of the Flowers name we shall hear later today. Uh, our Wrens, Joanna Chorley, Lorna Cocaine, and Margaret O'Connell, and their relatives who are here. Uh, Margaret Bullen, Colossus Wira. I understand this is one of yours down here. <laughs> um, sons of Henry John Kane, who is a Colossus engineer. Brian Randall in front of me. Brian, whose early research into the Colossus, very early research into the Colossus, and his subsequent publication of his journey of discovery has done much to enhance our knowledge here. Uh, the history of this place and the Colossus in particular Without his early work, we would not see what we see today. I must mention Margaret. Margaret Sale, who together with her husband Tony, that many of you will have met, did so much to preserve our heritage here and make this place the success that it is today. People say that uh, ladies carry a lot of different things in their handbags, powder compacts, lipsticks. Margaret carries screwdrivers. <laughs> I must also thank the Colossus Rebuild team, members of whom are here today, for their handiwork that you see before you. My colleague uh, Chris next door, as we move next door, will introduce some of our uh, honored guests next door. In building TNMOC over the years, um, we've been helped by many people who've contributed to this story. And one key supporter who sadly can't be here today is Jerry Roberts, Captain Jerry Roberts. Jerry has been here many times, and he has helped us understand the full picture of how Tunney was broken. Not just the contribution made by the machines, but also that all-important story of the people, particularly those who worked in the testery. Now, we'll hear contributions from Jerry at several parts in the proceedings today. The first one of these, is a welcome message that he recorded last week, which we'd like to play for you now. Well, greetings to you all. It's wonderful to see people here on this 70th anniversary. Uh, well, I was one of the senior cryptographers who worked on Tony, the other major system aside from Enigma, and I was uh, for four years working on this, turning out these top-level messages, quite a number of them signed by Hitler himself, and the rest all signed by top brass 
I'm sure for many of you that have met Jerry, uh, you'll join with me in passing our sincere thanks to him for taking the time and trouble to record such a, a poignant uh, message. As I say, he's been a great supporter and has highlighted to us the most important aspect of the work here, in his view, the people, and more of that later. So let me try and set the scene of what we'll see today briefly. Firstly, we're going to talk about Intercept and Y stations next door in the Tunney Gallery. Um, these Y stations were established originally in World War I and clearly enhanced dramatically during World War II. Operated by a range of agencies including the Army, Navy and RAF, plus the Foreign Office uh, and, and others. They collected the traffic that was processed here at Bletchley Park. Without the hard work of people at those Y stations, Bletchley Park would have nothing to do. This is a completely serial chain of which everybody depends on everybody else. Secondly, we're going to talk about the intelligence target, the Lorentz machine. Substantially more complex than the more generally known Enigma, uh, built by the Lorentz Company of Berlin in the 1930s and commissioned in, its, uh, in the form that we know it specifically to encipher messages for the German high command. It was the top material. 
Uh, the chief engineer was Gerhard Grimsen from Brunswick, and he'd been working for Lorentz since 1926. And the machine he designed was formidable. Make no doubt, it was formidable. The signals being transmitted using those machines were first heard in early 1940 by a group of policemen on the south coast who were actually listening out for something totally different. They were listening for German spy transmissions from within the UK. And they were, although unidentified at the time, subsequently we discovered that those transmissions were from the Oberkommando de Wehrmacht. Thirdly, we're going to talk about the code breakers. Uh, Brigadier John Tiltman, one of the top code breakers here, took a particular interest in these Lorentz enciphered messages. They were given the code name as we now know of FISH, um, and the messages were enciphered using that Lorentz machine. Tiltman knew a great deal about cryptography and established very early on the principles that he thought that that tiny machine was using. He reasoned that if the operators of those machines made a mistake, there was a chance that he would be able to work on establishing what was called the key stream that came out of these machines, and that would give a break into the tunny traffic. This was extraordinarily difficult. And he would have to wait a little while for a, such a serious mistake to happen. The number of intercepts, as Jerry pointed out, started ramping up quite dramatically. And at that time, a section was formed here in Bletchley Park, headed by Major Ralph Tester, known as the Testery. Uh, a number of what were called debts, this work that Tiltman had done, were found. But the amount of effort necessary to break these messages was extraordinarily high. And they didn't make a lot of headway until this one single critical mistake made by the Germans in 1941. And in summary, a German operator broke the rules. He sent a set of enciphered traffic, which we believe probably from Athens to Vienna, about 4,000 characters, which was completely enciphered. And when it arrived at the other end, the person who received it sent a message back saying, I'm terribly sorry, I didn't get that. Please, would you send it again? The critical error was that he sent it using exactly the same wheel settings and exactly the same cipher start positions, but this time he shortened the message. And there are people who are much more familiar with the mathematics of that process than I here today who will tell you the significance of that. We don't have time for that today, but all I can say is it was absolutely critical to being able to establish the workings of the Lorentz machine. It was very fortunate that the interceptors at Knockholt realized the importance of these two messages. And they alerted Bletchley Park. And they were sent post haste to Tiltman. Tiltman looked at those messages, and he got a lot further than before. And he was able to recover most, if not all, of the text. As well as recovering the text, he recovered this thing called the key stream central to the operation of the machine. And then he gave this long stretch of information to a chemistry graduate named Bill Tutt. I really can't say enough about Bill Tutt and how exceptional the piece of work was that he did. Jerry mentioned that he sat in the same office as Bill, with Bill with a pencil in his hand, looking into the middle distance. And Jerry says he really wasn't sure what Bill was doing. In fact, sometimes he thought he wasn't doing anything at all. In reality, he was recreating the inner workings of the Lorentz machine without ever seeing it. And he got it right. As Tony Sale would tell us, this was done in the era of BC, before computers. So he produced a lot of paper and a lot of effort. And after many months, that research section worked out the complete structure of this machine. This was extraordinary. Without that piece of work, nothing more would have happened here. So at the beginning of 1942, the post office research labs were asked to produce an implementation of the logic that Tut had worked out. And that led to what you see next door, the Tunney machine. 
If the code breakers had got their work right, as we'll see today, and the wheel settings were right when you typed in ciphertext, out came the original message. Now more people came on the scene. Max Newman came on the scene in 1942. He was a mathematician. He had an engineering background and he believed it was possible to automate this process of finding the wheel start positions. He first commissioned a machine called Heath Robinson. I don't know if any of you remember the Heath Robinson. Well, it, as I understand it, it was pretty much a Heath Robinson machine and I think it might have been christened by the Wrens and so on here, Robinson, because of its horrendous nature. Um, we have a video clip, very unusual, of Max Newman from 1977. In a very guarded way, you can see his mind working. He's very guarded in what he says about the motivation about this machine. He, with him on this clip is Jack Good, who was one of the code breakers who was working here at the time. They had got out some of the, um, the messages by a very slow hand process by uh, comparing certain uh, runs of things with each other uh, by a process which it seemed to me was an imitation of what the machine was doing on the other side that uh, enciphered it. And it occurred to me that if we, that we should be able perhaps to make a machine which would imitate theirs and, as it were, do the work for us. The first outcome was a single machine which was operated by a few wrens uh, and was called by them uh, Robinson after Heath Robinson. It was called the Heath Robinson, of course, after the well-known artist who used to draw machines that were made of sealing wax and string. And sometimes we thought that Heath Robinson was like that. It would tend to go up in flames uh, from time to time. <laughs> Not quite as bad, but you could smell the smoke coming out and you'd switch it off. The equipment was not uh, very, very good and it didn't lead to very much success. Its main value was in showing that the statistical methods were useful so that the later, much more efficient machine, the Colossus, was uh, designed with some confidence that it would be useful. Colossus design started in March 1943. And by December 1943, all the various circuits were working and the 1500 valve Mark I machine uh, was dismantled, shipped up to Bletchley Park and assembled here to become operational in late January 1944. As we're celebrating today, it was successful on the 5th of February 1944 in recovering the wheel settings on that critical enciphered message tape. On the strength of that, an order was placed for four further machines, and that was increased to 12 at the end of April. So we're going to start our reenactment now of this code-breaking process. But first, let's hear from that fantastic post office engineer, a very understated man, at the time of this recording in 1977, still under the control of the Official Secrets Act, telling his remarkably understated story of how he and his team built the first Colossus. This at the time was our AC Bridge Laboratory and it was where we assembled the first Colossus. By that time the problems and processing involved in code breaking had become so complicated that the mechanical switches and relays which we were using were neither fast enough nor reliable enough to be useful. It occurred to me that electronic equipment, including valves, could be made to do the same functions as mechanical switches, very much faster and more reliably, and that this would solve our problems. I made suggestions on these lines, which were not at first received very favorably, because it was known and believed from radar and radio experience that valves were not very reliable and not reliable enough. But we knew from our pre-war researchers not only how to use valves and electronic equipment which would perform the same functions as mechanical switches, but also that if they were left undisturbed, were not moved about, 
and were not switched on and off, but were left on continuously, that they could be very reliable. So that when we uh, contemplated using 2,000 valves or more in one piece of equipment, we were pretty confident that it would be satisfactory. So we went ahead and made one, and that was the first Colossus. So I was asked to go to Dollis Hill and take my toolkit. We had a meeting chaired by the then director of Dollis Hill, and he told us that we were to build this equipment called Colossus, and that it was really the top secret project of them all, not to be ever mentioned outside to anybody. We kept our eyes down on Colossus, and when we finished wiring the racks, the whole thing was moved to Bletchley Park, and we followed it there. I remember being somewhat impressed at the main gate, with the sentries armed by what appeared to be wooden clubs, and the double fencing, and a dog inside the fence. That was all very enjoyable. The Colossus makes a lot of noise. And then we got it to the point where we knew that electronically it was okay. Then it was turned over to the mathematicians and the program people who ran their stuff on it and proclaimed it was good, bad or indifferent according to what they thought. The way I looked at it was that we'd done a job, enjoyed ourselves doing it and been quite safe. You know, nobody was dropping bombs on us or doing anything like that. We'll hear more of that story when our cameras rejoin us in this gallery. But for now, we're going to take a short pause as they move next door to the Tunney Gallery to start our reenactment of the co-baking process with the interception of signals at Knockholt. Uh, Andy, greetings from the Tunney Room. Um, I'm going to mention just a couple of the guests that I have here in the Tunney Room. Uh, we have Richard Yalden over to my left, who's the son of that amazing mathematician, uh, nephew, sorry, of that amazing mathematician, Bill Tutt. Uh, very, very welcome to you. Um, Sven Tester, I believe, is over on my right, um, the son of Colonel Ralph Tester, uh, a very, very famous working at the Testery, which is, which is excellent, very, very great welcome to you. Um, Maisie Haywood, down at the front here, um, wife of Gil Haywood, uh, one of the Tunney engineers um, who did so much important work here. So thank you very much for coming um, uh, and thank you, for the rest of you, uh, for being here too. I must mention too, our Tunney Rebuild team. Uh, many of them are here today um, and it's their efforts that have put uh, all this together for you to see today. So I'm going to say a, a thanks to them, and in particular to John Petter, who's behind me, who's going to lead and tell you about the reenactment that you're about to see. So without any more delay, over to you. Right, uh, we're down at Knockholt now, which was the uh, main intercept station uh, during the war. Uh, for German Nun Morse transmissions. That was ra mainly radio teleprinter, which was ultimately enciphered by the, the Lorentz machine. Um, we took over in uh, May 1942 from uh, the Metropolitan Police at Denmark Hill. And uh, we've got a display here of the sort of equipment that, uh, that they uh, were using at the time down at, at Knockholt. Um, and it was uh, run by the Foreign Office, so hopefully we should have a, uh, have a signal coming in if I turn the volume up. Okay, we had to take the uh, messages down on what was known as an undulator, which is this piece of equipment here, and it produces a uh, a wiggly line on a narrow paper tape, which was called slip. The reason it was done like this was uh, the Lorentz cipher machine actually enciphered all the control keys of the teleprinter. So you couldn't actually take the messages, the enciphered messages, down on a standard teleprinter. Okay, and uh, the sound you're hearing coming from the loudspeaker is actually what the sound of the transmission sounded like coming from Germany at that time. So, I think we've probably got the slip 
received, OK. Now, once the slip was received on the narrow paper tape, it was taken across to another hut at Knockholt, which was actually the slip reading section. And um, this was quite a tedious task, reading the slip, because it had to be read by eye and put onto uh, perforated tape. I expect uh, most of you are familiar with perforated tape. Anybody who's used telex or early computers will recognise it. And it had to be done by hand by the slip readers at Knockholt. Uh, there was some 300 slip readers at Knockholt made up of ATS and civilian uh, girls. OK, so uh, if you'd like to come over to the, to the uh, slip reading section, please. And the machines that uh, our ATS girl is going to be sitting at are um, the type of perforating machines that they used. It must have been quite a noisy environment because when, when uh, Sophie turn, and that turns on the uh, machines, you'll see what quite a noise they make. OK, so away you go. Start reading your slips. Now, some of our slip readers can read at about 60 characters a second. Uh, the tape was tra the slip was transported by them, so they could read it. OK. Now, messages were long, so anything for up to 10,000 characters long. And uh, our slip readers, some of them could read at 60 characters a minute. But even so, a 6,000 character message could take something like one and a half hours to, to put onto perforated tape. OK. Now, two slip readers read the same slip independently of each other and each produced a perforated tape. The reason for that was it was assumed two slip readers would not make the same mistakes in receiving the undulator slip. OK, so um, they actually compared the two tapes against each other to see if there was any differences, because in theory they, sh they should be both the same. So if they found a, an error, they would actually have to refer back to the undulator slip uh, to see where the, where the mistake was, because the undulator slip was obviously the most accurate record of the, of the transmission. It was quite a tedious task, and uh, these girls no, had probably little idea what they were doing, and they couldn't be told of where they were going to or what they were being used for. My tape is error three. This one can be used to be sent to station X. Hello, station X. Station Y, not called here. Just had to send the next one through over dark, um, circuit three. Details as follows. Serial number BR06152244. Time of reception GMT1223. Frequency 6050 kilocycles. Message length 5845 characters. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. They also produced a printed copy of the cipher text as well. Uh, and that was normally sent up to Bletchley by dispatch rider on motorcycles. Excuse me. Once the messages had arrived at Bletchley, <coughs> it would have been as associated with the details that uh, was taken over the phone by the REN and uh, then taken through to Colossus. Uh, for processing, and then, uh, then going off through to Colossus uh, for the processing. Okay, let me now hand over to my colleagues who will show you the next stage in this process. The most important thing for Colossus is to know how long this message is. Two reasons. First one is the machine does a statistical attack, so it's all based on statistics, so therefore you need to know what your sample is going to be, and secondly, the length of that message. Because you've got to somehow put it on the bedstead. A different message length means that it will go on in different ways. So there is the dreaded manual, 
and in there there would be pictures of how to load tapes of a particular length. And there's one I drew area, uh, drew, um, drew up earlier. That's what it would look like. So now I'm going to load the, uh, the tape onto the machine. Already found the starting position. It gets clamped in the, in the gate with the very famous bulldog clip. So I'm going to run it round. It has to be run round clockwise. If I did this anti-clockwise, what would happen is, because this is pre-joined, you would actually end up with a double loop in the tape. So it has to be put on clockwise. Now you can see why there's a minimum height requirement to work on Colossus. Right. The tape is now on the machine, the gate, the light gate has to be shut. We turn the bedstead on. This tape's running at 5,000 characters a second. It's the fastest paper tape reader that's ever been produced. The next thing we have to do is to, going into the machine is the message data. And to that message data, you have to add the patterns of the two wheels you're going to work on. And that is the chi wheels. So if you want to flick the switches down to add the chi wheel patterns onto the data, and that's being added together now in the machine. Now what, is going, what you're going to do is you're going to do a statistical attack and you're going to go through all the different combinations of just two wheels. These are the two chi wheels. And for every position on that tape, there is the two bits of data plus the two bits coming off the chi wheel. So in every position on that tape, you have, you have a, a result of two bits adding to two bits. The result is just two bits and you compare the current answer with the previous answer and you look for a correlation and every time you see it you count it. Having done that you move to the next position and you do the same thing again. How it works is very simple. Imagine it as a bucket of coins where you have a thousand coins in a bucket. The two wheels are now set to position one one. You throw your bucket up, which is your count. You got 500. 500. That's your average. It's going to be 500. Position 1-1, one, one, you do your count. Let's say you get 509. Yeah? It's what you would expect. You go to the next position, which is 1 and 2. Throw your bucket up, and you get a count of 496. Nothing unusual about that. You go to the next position, which is 1 and 3, you throw your bucket up, this time you get 761. Wow, yeah? Something is going on. And what you're interested in is the wheel positions and the score. And that's exactly what Cossus is going to do. It's going to do that statistical attack, going through all the combinations of just two wheels. Now, we don't have sufficient time to go through all the combinations because there's 1,271. So I have preset the machine about 10 back. So it's only going to run through about 10 before it will actually do anything. So we need to set the machine up, first of all, for the algorithm, which is 1 plus 2, that's what it's called, developed by Built Up. Now that is done on the red switches there, so if you want to flip the first two, so you're adding one plus two together. The result, which is what you're looking for, your correlation, that's going to go into one of five counters. And this time, I'm going to put it into, actually put it into one and two. So if you press one and two, 
So your statistical account is now going to go into positions one and two, or counters one and two, should I say. The next thing is the wheels that we're going to work on, which is Kai wheels one and two. Kai wheel one would move round one position every time the message goes through. Kai wheel two will only move when Kai wheel one has gone through all of its combina combinations. That's done on the two switches there. Yeah. Yeah. Now the last thing we have to do is to sort out the printing. Because this is statistics, a lot of the stuff you're going to get is this flat random you're not interested in. This is your 500. That is set up on the switches over here, which I will, I will set it up there. That's now set to a score of 3,000. Why is it 3,000? Because the length of the tape is... 5,800. So that is just above your average, if you want. And the next thing is we need to fully run the machine. And if we can do that, yeah, my mistake. There she goes. What is actually printed off there is, and again, is the starting positions of the two wheels. I preset this so it just ran through about 10 start positions. And the score on here is a very, very high score. And that indicates that you found the starting positions for Kai wheel one and two. So if you want to take that, So that is the information that they now need to actually uh, decrypt that message. And the score on there should be something, yeah, 3,147. Your flat random would be about 2,900. Off you go. During the war, you wouldn't have this amount of light in this room. What sort of lighting was around the Colossus? Was it just strip a lighting. strip lighting? And all the windows were black side. I never saw the windows open at all. Well, even in daytime, I never saw them. Not ours. Ours was all closed off and black side. You've watched a very challenging process involving everybody working together with a lot of things having to work right for the answer to come out. It's something that I wonder whether or not we have the diligence to do today quite as well as it was done at the time. So, my colleague in the Tunney Gallery will be showing the last stage of this process, which is the ciphertext being typed into the Tunney machine that has been set up with the right wheel setting. Right, uh, we're now down in F block now in the Tunney room. Uh, F block is unfortunately no longer with us. That was demolished in uh, 1986. It actually stood on the piece of grass in front of this building. Um, through the good fortunes of Bill Tut's work, uh, the Newman group approached uh, the GPO research establishment at Dollis Hill and uh, they were asked if they could build an emulation of the Lorentz SZ42 on the work that uh, Beltas had done, which they did. And the machine that they came up with was this rack of equipment here. It's called the Tunny Machine, um, after the fish Tunny. Uh, I believe it was given the name Tunny because the first link that was broken, the Athens, the end link, was given the title Tunney here at Fletcher Park. Uh, but by about the end of the war, we think there was probably about uh, 15 or so of these machines here, and uh, we think there was probably one for each German radio tower to link. Okay. So the 12 rotors on of the Lorentz machine are actually sorry, represented by this large jack field here in the centre of the uh, centre of the rack. Uh, as I say, the Tunney machine is an exact emulation 
of the Lorentz machine. Okay, and we've got the 12 rotors on the jack field and associated with each rotor is a strip of lamps which gives an indication where the rotor is on its rotation. Okay. And the first strip of jacks is the pattern. Um, that had to be worked out by hand and that, that was actually how the Germans had set up the little toggles around the circumference of each rotor and that could last several weeks so you can probably see why they probably had a tunny machine for each German link because it was easier to leave the pattern up on the machine because it didn't change that often and it took a lot of time to put the pattern on. But more importantly the next row of jacks is the start position for each rotor and uh, once we've got the uh, start positions coming from Colossus, our wrens can start to put in the, in the pegs in the relevant positions for the start positions worked out by uh, Colossus. So if you'd like to go ahead and start putting the pegs in for me, please. K1, forty. Okay. K2, one. Okay. K3, five. Okay, K4, 2. Okay, K5, 3. Okay, M120. Okay, M26. Okay, S125. Okay, S221. Okay, S317. Okay, S427. Okay, and S59. Okay. Okay. Right, thank you. Now, hopefully, in theory now, we've got the our tunny machine set up in exactly the same way as the Germans set their Lorentz machines up before they went into cipher. So, in theory now, uh, um, we can start typing in the cipher text, which has, came up, which has already come up from Knockout by Dispatch Rider, the printed copy okay, that I mentioned earlier. And uh, we should be able to switch the machine on now. And um, if you start typing in our cipher text, first of all we have to uh, reset the rotors to, uh, can you just knock the key down a little bit? Okay, operating the key resets the rotors now to where all the start pegs are. So in theory, as I said, we should now be in a position to start typing in the cipher text. Okay, away you go. And in theory, we should start seeing the plain text more or less plain text German being printed out. Okay. Okay. So we've now got our plain text, hopefully, and uh, that would now go off to uh, the intelligence huts, a relevant intelligent hut here at Bletchley, for the intelligence staff with watches to analyse because they could correlate it with other messages coming in, Enigma, etc., to build a big picture of the German war effort. Now, one of the significant um, breaks they were getting here using this equipment was the fact that the Germans had taken the uh, deception being carried out by the Allied Allies before the uh, D-Day landings, that the main attack would come up the Pas de Calais and the Normandy attack was made out to be a diversionary attack. And it was an important enabler for D-Day to go ahead that the, uh, the, the Allies knew that the Germans had taken this hoax. And we know now that uh, uh, several Panzer divisions were kept back, ready for the main attack at uh, Calais, which never came, and gave the Allies a, a chance to get a good foothold on, uh, 
on uh, the beaches. So you can appreciate the amount of effort it took um, to do this. Okay? Every effort at Knockholt was made to get an accurate copy of the signal because you couldn't ask the Germans to send it again if you missed it. Okay, all that checking, take hours, okay, getting the messages up here. They were sent twice just in case any errors crept in on the teleprinter landlines. They were checked again by comparing the tapes here. And then one would be selected to go to Colossus for uh, working out the wheel settings and ultimately being uh, deciphered on a tunny machine. So thank you very much. I'll hand you over to Andy. I shan't keep you much longer, but there's only two more things I would like to mention, uh, which are, firstly, we received um, an email recently, and I've mentioned uh, Ken Flowers and his family, Tommy's son, and uh, we received this email relatively recently. It says, Dear Lynn, this is to the operations director here at the museum, um, there has come into my safekeeping the leather briefcase used by Tommy Flowers at the time he left the post office research station. It was government property. Indeed, no doubt it still is. If the proprietaries were to be observed. And Tommy very properly handed it over to the responsible manager when he left. The responsible manager was my father's twin brother, Albert Webster, 1925 to 2010. Uncle Albert recognised the potential historical value of this briefcase and very improperly sequestered it away in the back of a cupboard somewhere and eventually took it home with him. In his declining years, he asked me whether I would like to be its next custodian and made it clear to his more immediate family that he wished it to be passed on to me. It's taken a while for that to happen since I no longer live in the UK, but I finally laid hands on it yesterday during a brief visit to England. I'm now wondering whether your museum would be the most appropriate next home for this briefcase where it might make an interesting and personal adjunct to the Colossus rebuild. Would you like it? With best regards, Christopher Webster. And this, Ken, where's Ken? This is that briefcase, which we would very much like you to come and touch before we... <laughs> I, I opened it earlier to discover it has papers in it. I haven't read them. I have no idea what they might be. I do, actually. You recognise it? Marvellous. Well, it's in proper hands for the moment, and with your permission, we'd like to display it here as yes, well. Certainly. Hold on to it for the moment and show your family, because there's another thing that we've heard today. We've, we've paid great respect to those people whose names have not really been spoken about very much, of which Tommy is clearly one, Bill Tutt and others. But how nice today that we've got one more surprise, which is the Flowers family is complete in as much as this beautifully behaved young gentleman here who has been taking part in all these proceedings is Tommy's great grandson. His name is Tommy. Today, it gets better. Today is his second birthday. Would you join with me in singing him happy birthday? <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Tommy. Happy birthday to you. We couldn't ask for a more fitting tribute to the Codebreakers. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for coming today. There are a few more formalities that we will follow with our uh, learning coordinator later, but for the time being, our, our recreation of the day is over. We really hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you to our reenactors and to everybody.